everyone. This is Larry Johnson from the New Media Consortium, and I'm here to welcome us all to the NMC Horizon Connect session with Howard Rheingold. Howard Rheingold is next smart. We're here to spend some time with Howard to uh, celebrate and learn more about his new book, and I'm uh, very, very pleased to do that. Before we get too far down the road, though, I want to reiterate uh, as Sam has in the chat, <laughs> everybody wants to make sure you know about this, is that uh, five of you are going to be able to get free copies of Howard's brand new book, NetSmart. Uh, just look for five trivia questions from at NMCOrg during the webinar on Twitter. And if you're the first person to answer those questions on Twitter with these hashtags, then you'll get a free copy. And that's number sign NetSmart and number sign NMCHZ. And so with that out of the way, I would like to welcome uh, Howard. Howard Rheingold's latest book is called NetSmart, and he's been the author of a number of really influential books at key points during uh, the history of the last 20 or so years. He served as editor of the Whole Earth Review, editor of the Millennium Whole Earth Catalog, he was the founding executive editor of Hotwired and the founder of Electric Minds. His teaching has always been important to Howard, and he's one of the most exciting and wonderful teachers that I've ever seen. He a, was a non-resident fellow at the Annenberg Center for Communication at USC in 2007, was a visiting professor at De Montfort University in the United Kingdom, He's taught journalism and social media at UC Berkeley and also at Stanford. And his current projects include the Social Media Classroom, the Cooperation Project, Rheingold U, 21st Century Literacies, and Info, Tension, and Curation Workshop. Howard's a longtime friend and contributor to the NNC community, both in the real and the virtual worlds. And we're very, very happy to have him here to discuss his new book this new book. So it's with great pleasure, Howard, that I turn the mic over to you. This is actually the kickoff of my book promotion since the actual pub date is tomorrow. So if you're concerned that the use of digital media are making our culture shallow, why not teach more people how to swim so we can all explore the deep end of the pool? The way you use a search engine stream video from your phone, update your Facebook status matters to you, to me, and to everyone, because the way we use these media today will influence the way they're used and misused far into the future. Uh, recently, a number of powerful critiques of the, the costs and the pitfalls of our use of social media have emerged, and I pay particular attention to those that are based on empirical evidence. And there's no doubt that we really need to take a critical look at, at the costs, what we may be leaving out of our lives when we pay attention to social media. But while critiques are necessary, they are not sufficient. Knowing that something is broken it doesn't always help you understand how to fix it. So instead of asking, is Google making us stupid? Is Facebook commoditizing our privacy? Is Twitter chopping our attention into micro slices? I've been asking myself and others how to use social media intelligently, humanely, and above all, mindfully. I've drawn on my own nearly 30 years of experience online. I've looked closely at the uh, experimental research literature, and I've talked to many of the masters of today's media, whose names you probably recognize, from Jimmy Wales to, to Dana Boyd to Jane McGonigal, uh, Barry Wellman, uh, Pierre Levy, Robin Good, Robert Scoble. Net Smart is about what I've learned. And what I've learned is that we really could improve the empowerment of individuals, the ability of individuals to, to live in an all, always-on world 
in a, a more intelligent, humane, and mindful way and improve the commons by teaching five literacies, starting with the fundamental literacy of attention, including participation, the many flavors of collaboration, crap detection, or if you want to be more polite, critical consumption of information, and network know-how. These are not really rocket science. It's not even algebra or learning the multiplication tables. It's just that they're not really taught uh, to people in the schools anymore or haven't been started being taught in the schools. When I talk about literacies, I emphasize the social aspect of these. If you know how to swim, that will serve you well if you fall into deep water. If you're the only person in the world who knows how to swim, it will still help you. If you're the only person in the world who knows how to read and write or to, to make a web page, it's not going to help you that much. Each of these skills depend on being able to use them in concert with others to accomplish things in the real world. So let's start with attention, really the foundation of thinking and communicating. I started bumping into questions about attention in the classroom. But of course, we see the issue of our attention being challenged by our devices every day. When you look over in the, at a stoplight and see that somebody in the car next to you is, is texting, uh, when you see somebody walking down the street bumping into things, you know, the Pew Internet and American Life survey uh, recent, recently indicated that their, their survey shows that one in six people report having bumped into something or somebody while walking down the street looking at their, their smartphone. And then, of course, there's a question of uh, paying attention to our, our children. When they want our attention, are we looking at our, our Blackberry or our iPad? So uh, in the classroom, uh, if you, any college professor knows that when you look out at the classroom these days, many of your students are looking at their laptops. And they could well be paying attention to you, but you don't really know. This was one, one of my first uh, classrooms at UC Berkeley. And one of the first things I did was ask the students permission to take a little video of them which I then projected on the screen in, in front of them. I put it on YouTube with their permission, and I projected it. And when I projected it, I put another camera at the back of the room. And so notice this student here has decided, uh, instead of watching the video on the screen in the front of the room, he's going to my video blog to watch exactly the same video on, on his uh, PC. And then, for some reason, he switches to look at my uh, personal website. And then he switches back to doing his email. Now, the interesting thing about this student is that he was a, a rare A-plus student. And I'm sure that if I had stopped him and asked him what I was talking about, he would have been able to tell me. So you, most of you, I hope, are aware of the recent research by Cliff Nass at Stanford about media multitasking that shows that that 95% of the people who think that they are accomplishing tasks more effectively by multitasking are actually degrading their performance on those individual tasks. But there is a small percentage in NASA's research and others' research, around 5% of people who are able to multitask effectively without degrading their performance. And I suspect that this student was one of them. The question that arose was whether he was just better at juggling his attention, the way some people are better at, at running or jumping, or whether he had learned something that the rest of us could learn. So I started looking into the idea of whether attention can be trained. And of course, one of the, the first things you come across is the notion of mindfulness, of training oneself to become aware of how one is deploying one's attention. In the contemplative and meditative disciplines, mindfulness is something that is cultivated through meditation. 
if if you don't want to use a, a word that has uh, spiritual connotations, you could use the word metacognition. The idea being that we do have the mental capability to create a kind of inner observer that knows where we're deploying our attention. So at first, with my work with my students, and then with my work with myself, I began thinking about ways that we could probe our attention to our attention. In the classroom, I asked the students to come up with attention probes, and they came up with a lot of interesting ones. One was to uh, ring a gong at uh, a random interval, and then we would write down on a, on a yellow post-it note if we were thinking about something that was related to the subject matter that was being discussed at the moment, on an orange post-it note if we were thinking about something that was tangentially related to the, the subject of the day, and on a red post-it note if we were thinking about something that had nothing to do with what was going on in the classroom. Then we would put them all up on the wall, and you could see pretty quickly the distribution of attention. There are a number of different attention probes that we used in, in the classroom, and from that I began to develop some ideas. There's very simple training that we could use to develop our attention, particularly when we're online. When we're, we're trying to improve our ability to use our attention effectively, particularly online. I call it infotension, con combining attention with information. And I look at two different aspects of it. I look at the cognitive aspect, and I look at the information tools aspect. So we all need to make decisions all the time when we're online. Are we going to ignore or uh, immediately pay attention to that email that just came in? Are we going to click on that, that link? Are we going to follow that tweet? Or are we going to ignore it? Or are we maybe going to open a tab and pay attention to it later? Or are we going to tag it and bookmark it for much later? I, my objective in infotention training with students is to get them to begin making these decisions more deliberately, to begin understanding that they're making decisions about deploying their attention, and to make those decisions in respect to their own goals, and uh, then to make them not only deliberately, but to make them faster. Uh, one of the things we do is to try to match our attention to, to the tool set. So I use the, the NetVibes RSS aggregator to demonstrate that. And I use that because you can have dashboards for different subjects, and you can have tabs on those dashboards. And within those tabs, you can have feeds. So I arrange the most relevant topics on the left and the, mo and the feeds that are, are most often updated towards the top. And so if I've got a lot of time to mess around, I can look through the, the sources of information about the subjects that interest me. But if, I, if my priorities are different, then I can skim just what's on the upper left part. In order to know what I ought to be doing, I need to set my own priorities. And of course, we're, only you know what your priorities are for the day. So um, every day in the morning, I write down a couple of goals on a piece of paper and set it in the, the corner of my uh, desk so that it's in the periphery of my vision. And every once in a while, naturally, my, my gaze will fall upon that. And I use that as an occasion to ask myself what I'm paying attention to. Those of you who do meditation on the breath know that when you're, you're paying attention to your breath and your mind wanders, you, you don't judge, you simply go back to paying attention to your breath. So the idea here is to ask myself, when I catch sight of what my goals are for the day, whether what I'm doing at the moment is going to get me any closer to that. I took a leaf from Professor B.J. Fogg at Stanford, who's been teaching people how to establish new habits. And he has a very simple three-step program to do that. First, start small. And there's nothing smaller than writing a few goals on a piece of paper before you sit down at your computer. Uh, the second is to find a place for it. So I do it at the beginning of the day, and I put it at the periphery of my vision. And the third step is to, is to repeat, establish a new habit. So I now, I can't claim to have superhuman control over my attention, but I am beginning to become 
aware of how I'm deploying my attention and beginning to make decisions rather than simply follow the impulses that uh, the social media affords. So social media certainly afford distraction. I don't think any of us would dispute that. I don't think it compels distraction. I think a lot of it has to do with our lack of training in attention and we can we can remedy that. So in the book I get into a lot of detail about how our attention works and how we can begin training it. Uh, right now I just want to give you a few, a few points uh, to take away from this. One is that attention can be trained. It's not just the ancient contemplative di disciplines but there's a, a great deal of uh, neuroscience. Um, mindfulness in the brain uh, by uh, Dr. Robert Siegel is a good place to look at the uh, accumulating evidence that we can learn how to train our attention. Breathe. I learned this from uh, Linda Stone who noticed that she was holding her breath when she was doing her email sometimes and she asked other people whether they were holding their breath. She calls this email apnea and reminds us that this is part of the fight or flight response. If you were one of our, our ancestors walking through the, the savanna and you heard a rustling in the grass, you would stop, you would hold your breath and your endocrine system would begin pumping out uh, hormones to prepare you for fight or flight. Of course, when we're sitting in front of our computers, we're, we're not really being stalked by saber-toothed tigers 500 times a day. We're amping up our nervous system for really no reason at all. So one of the simplest things to do is simply to stop every once in a while and, and take a breath. And of course, uh, breathing is important to a lot of meditative disciplines because it is a, a a proven way to connect what's going on in your mind with what's going on in your brain. In fact, attention to intention is how the mind changes the brain. When we have a thought or a, a, a set of thoughts, we are firing certain neural networks and not firing others. And when we repeat that thought, we strengthen the connections between those neurons. We strengthen the, that neural network. We make it um, more likely to fire again. The Donald Hebb's theory uh, has been stated as a nerves that uh, fire together, wire together. So when you do an exercise like asking yourself, uh, what am I paying attention to? Or in meditation, just bringing your attention back to your breath. What you're doing is you are strengthening the parts of your brain that pay attention to what's going on in your brain. I want to talk about critical consumption. When I, I started thinking about this, uh, I came across Ernest Hemingway's quote that uh, every good journalist ought to have a, a, an internal crap detector. And so if you want to be less polite, you can call it uh, crap detection. It really started when my daughter and search engines came of age around the same time. She was in middle school when uh, InfoSeq and AltaVista came along. This was before Google existed. And I noticed that she was putting terms into search engines for her homework. So I did sit down and explain to her that things had changed, that in the olden days of a few years ago, you could go to the library and you get a book out, and you might disagree with that book, but you could be pretty sure that there was an author, an editor, uh, and a publisher who took some pains to ascertain whether the claims of fact in that book were accurate. You put a term into a search engine, you can get the answer to any question within seconds. But it's up to you to determine whether it's good information, bad information, misinformation, or disinformation. So I sat her down uh, with a website. Uh, I sat her down, not, not with Google, it was before Google, and I asked for her to search for Martin Luther King. And you notice today on Google, the third hit down, and I think this is about the fourth or fifth hit down on Bing as well, is this site, Martin Luther King Jr., A True Historical Examination. And if you, if you go and look at that site, it looks just like a site uh, about the civil rights leader. If you begin reading some of the articles, you will see that they have a 
pretty extreme and pretty dim view of that civil rights leader. So my, my daughter asked me, how can I tell whether this is legit? And I said, well, first of all, look for an author. So there was an author for this article, and we could search on that author. And um, that author's uh, record of writing gave us some reasons to doubt. But we couldn't find an, an author for the website itself. So I showed her how to use who is. There are a lot of who is utilities. I used easy who is. Who is is a utility that's part of the internet that enables anyone to find out who is claiming responsibility for maintaining a, a website. So we, we could put the URL for that martinluthercingjr.org website into easy who is and find out that someone by the name of Don Black at stormfront.org was uh, responsible for it. So again, let's search on stormfront.org. And it turns out that that's a white nationalist community. So that was just a little bit of an example of how you can go on a, a bit of a detective hunt and find out whether a site is what it claims to be. I've collected a lot of sites that I show to students to demonstrate to them that what you see on the internet isn't always as legitimate as it may appear. This one is kind of funny. It's, it was kind of scary the first time I saw it. It didn't reveal that it was a joke as easily as it does now. And uh, so this is a free online pregnancy test. It asks you to fill in your name and press the start button. When you, and I, I filled in the name Joe. And when, when you press the start button, you get a little flash animation that says, sit still while we scan you. And notice that there are apparently legitimate ads for pregnancy tests in the, in the right uh, sidebar there. So I started the pregnancy test. And congratulations, Joe. You're with child. Our remote testing system has detected that you're pregnant. Uh, most people will know that this is a joke. Uh, I wonder, though, about some people. You know, that there are a certain number of pregnancies every year that come about because the people are not entirely clear on where babies come from. Anyway, the, the further you get into this site, the more clear it is that, that it's not legit. So if you click on View My Baby, it turns out that it's a girl. And if I ask who's the daddy, it turns out it's Fabio. So I, I chose to stop the exercise at this point, but you could go on. And in a sense, this is you know a, a, a bit of a, a parody of people's credulity about the web. Uh, this site looks completely legitimate, certainly nicely designed. It claims to have a primate, a mandrill, who has been trained to understand English and who can re respond with a keyboard. And of course, this is t totally bogus. Uh, then there's the uh, endangered Pacific Northwest tree octopus. A number of teachers use this uh, with their students. It is, of course, a, uh, a completely bogus species, non-existent species. So. Um, I, again, in the chapter in the book, I get into a lot more detail. And in particular, if you are looking for political information, then our democracy depends on it. And if you're looking for medical information, your life may well depend on it. Uh, most people who are diagnosed with a disease are going to Google that disease and Google their symptoms. And there are ways to do crap detection on medical information and political information. First of all, think like a detective. Look for clues on the design of the website, the author of the, the website. Uh, don't accept what you see at face value. Uh, assume that you may be fooled and do a few tests. Uh, secondly, search to learn. You know, a lot of times you just want to search to find out where's the nearest place to get a pizza. But if you are a student or a scholar and you're seeking to learn about a subject, the, the first search query you, you give is ought to be just the, the beginning. You ought to broaden that query. You ought to look at the snippets on the, on the sites that are returned and see if you can learn something about refining your query. Look at the third or fourth page of results. Use more than one search engine. Look for authors and search on their names. 
this is really simple and very powerful. If I had one thing to teach an eight-year-old before they got online, it would be look for an author. And if there's not an author, I would begin to be skeptical about that, that website until uh, proven otherwise. And if you can find an author, then search on that author and see what else that author's written and what others have to say about it. Triangulate. That's what good journalists do, is they look for three different sources before they pass along a report. So I remember about a year ago when the Egyptian revolution was happening, there was a report that Egypt had shut down internet access to the country, which is something that uh, comes under the category of interesting if true. But I couldn't find anything on CNN or Al Jazeera about it, so I didn't retweet it. I did, however, ask for uh, corroboration uh, on Twitter. And one person uh, directed me to someone I, I knew to be working with people in the Middle East who claimed to be on the phone with someone there uh, in Egypt uh, who said that, that indeed their internet access was cut off. Someone else reminded me of the ping utility, and, and uh, I looked up some sites in uh, in Egypt and tried to ping them and was unable to get to them. So those, that was two points. When there was a news report that, that came along, that gave me three points in my triangle and I repeated it. Now, people who did not triangulate after the Haiti earthquake found themselves passing along bad information. There was a rumor that if you sent a text message to a certain number, you would be supporting sending medical personnel to Haiti. Turned out to be, again, a, a, a hoax. And the people who passed that information along uh, were passing along bad information. This is, is, is somewhat related. Uh, Cass Sunstein has written in the Daily Re, and uh, Eli Pariser has written in the Filter Bubble about the both the, the human propensity and the affordance of the internet that, to enable us to pay more and more attention to sources that we mainly agree with. Uh, and Sunstein uh, cited research that shows that groups of people who mostly agree with each other tend to make more extreme uh, decisions, the, uh, the notion of the echo chamber. So one of the, the things that I teach is uh, cultivating personal learning networks. I suspect that most people in the NMC group understands how personal learning networks work. If you don't have one or two or three people in your uh, PLN who are intelligent, who you, you trust to be honest people, but whose opinions differ from yours so much that they annoy you on a regular basis, then you're, you're probably in an echo chamber. You know, I'm not really monitoring the chat while I'm, I'm doing this, but uh, I will look back at it uh, from time to time. So I want to move to the, the next uh, all-important literacy of participation. Attention and crap detection are so somewhat internal uh, to the individual. Participation is when we take that uh, internal literacy, those internal skills, and we begin turning it to participating along with others. And of course, that looks like a Texas crowd there. Um, of course, we wouldn't be talking here today. We wouldn't be using the web if millions of people did not participate. The web famously is a many-to-many -many medium. It wasn't built from the top down. It wasn't built by a television network or a a book publisher was built by millions of people who put up websites and links. And participation, like the other literacies, affects both the individual's ability to survive and thrive today, but it also affects the quality of life in the commons. There are so many ways to participate. I want to just mention a couple of examples of participation to demonstrate their power. A few years ago, the Warner Brothers lawyers uh, attempted to set, uh, shut down a, a fan site for uh, Harry Potter fans who were writing their versions of Harry Potter stories. Heather Lauver organized a worldwide boy boycott of Warner Brothers that backed those lawyers off before they found out that she was 16 years old. 
Uh, Bev Harris, a previously somewhat obscure blogger who was uh, obsessed with the Diebold's uh, uh, black box voting machines. Black box because these are the machines that we use in our elections at the foundations of our democracy, but the, the workings of those machines are, are held uh, secretly. Uh, Harris found out that Diebold had accidentally put the source code up for its voting machines on a website, and she copied it and passed it around. Although she was an obscure blogger, um, less obscure bloggers uh, picked up on this. It found its way up the power law, up the, the food chain, and became a cause celeb. A group of students at Swarthmore posted the plans uh, for the voting machines, and uh, experts began vetting them for possible ways that they could be uh, cheated, and uh, Diebold sued. Uh, the U.S. courts found that those uh, Stanford students had the right to put up this information that is essential to democracy. And of course, you probably recognize the face of Wael Gonin, uh, one of the faces of the young people uh, who did use Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube as part of their organizing of the revolutions in Egypt. I don't want to get into the controversy right now of, of, the, of how important the role of social media was, but I did interview one of the um, militants who I had known for some years, and, and he did talk about the use of Facebook for years before this started, particularly useful for exiles uh, who were uh, staying in touch. I emphasized, uh, well, and here's a couple of other young people. Mark Zuckerberg was 19. Uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin were in their very early 20s when, when they uh, created new industries, uh, new multi-billion dollar industries, and I emphasized the youth of uh, these examples that simply to show that knowing how to create a web page, uh, knowing how to use a blog or a wiki can have real power, it can have political power, it can have economic power. One of the forms of participation that is being discussed these days is curation, and I wanted to concentrate on, on that one, although again in the book I talk about a number of different forms. I think this is a, a very broad-based form of collective intelligence. There's an awful lot of crap out there, and um, the best tool for finding good information as well as weeding out the bad information, is to find someone who knows what they're talking about and who is uh, saving their choices and making them available to others. I like Ross Mayfield's power law of participation that, that shows that people can start with very low threshold tools, such as just reading a website or maybe favoriting or liking it, and can move to a higher threshold of use, maybe you know, starting a virtual community or creating a wiki, and they can start with low engagement with the community and move all the way up to forms of collaborative intelligence that include very high levels of engagement with the community. Uh, by filtering the best stuff for each other, we are engaging in uh, both building and using collective intelligence. We all need to curate to some degree in order to transform information overload into useful knowledge. We, more information comes to our attention than we can use. We need to recognize swiftly that information that's the most useful. The, the nice thing about it is that we can make those our own choices available to others, and it can add up to something important. In, the open source world, they call it scratching an itch. If, for example, a new printer comes along and you have to write a software driver to, in order to make that printer work, it makes sense to, to contribute that code to the, the public code base. Not only are you demonstrating that you are an, an altruistic contributor, you are recruiting others who, when they change that printer, are going to help you change that code. If there's no additional cost to doing something in your own interest and making that public, then you not only draw positive attention to yourself, but you can contribute to a public good. The, the genius of social bookmarking is that I've got to tag for myself 
I've got to bookmark sites for myself. There's no additional cost to making my choices available to others. And of course, when millions of people do that, we get a very, very useful resource. One of the best ways to find an expert on a topic is to go look at Digo or Delicious, find what are the most popular websites for a particular tag, and then go look at who the earliest people to tag that website um, might be. Not a foolproof method, but it, one of a number of different methods for discovering expertise. If you want to establish a reputation as knowing what you're talking about, one of the best ways uh, to do that is to find sites that you consider to be uh, good and useful information about a, a topic of your expertise and to share that with others. And people who know what they're talking about will recognize that you do and will establish a reputation, will point other people your way, and ultimately will send information your way. Instead of uh, simply filtering the web yourself, others will help you filter it as well. You're performing a kind of personal search engine optimization when you curate. You are sending out signals to others who share your interest in a particular topic, that you are engaged in that topic, that you know what you're talking about. And uh, again, this will attract people who may not just take advantage of your decisions, but may share their decisions with you, may share information with you that, that could be interesting to you. So, um, sounds like an echo chamber. Well, you know, when you're looking for ex expertise about a particular topic, you're always going to find a community of people who are particularly interested in that. Um, and I'm going to, and I think the uh, antidote to the echo chamber is to make sure that you tune your personal learning network to include people who you don't agree with. And there may well be people who are interested in the same subject, but um, who have differences of opinion with you. So this is going to surface people not only who agree with you, but who share an interest and may have a different view on that topic. Social capital is loosely defined as the ability of a group of people to accomplish things together outside of the formal structures like laws and, and contracts. And networks of trust and norms of reciprocity are cited as the, the means by which groups of people can cultivate social capital, can use social capital. And there's um, nothing better than curation to get started. Henry Jenkins and others have talked about the effects of having a, a large number of people who are contributing to culture. Certainly, with the internet, as opposed to the age of mass media, is an age in which a very large number of people create culture that's consumed by others. A person who considers herself to be only a passive consumer of culture that is created by others thinks of herself as a different kind of citizen with a different kind of agency than a person who thinks of herself as a contributor to culture, somebody who, who may simply like something or curate something or blog about something. Uh, ultimately, I'm talking about effects on the individual and, and effects on the commons. I, I wrote this book in order to empower individuals to enable people to get along better in an always on world, but also to improve the commons. And I think the way to improve the commons is to enable people to make better decisions, to pass along better information, and to participate more effectively. There are a jillion forms of participation, and you can choose one that works for you. And there is a new one that comes up every day. So again, I get into a lot more detail in the book. I've got 500 footnotes in the book. The idea there is to not just s scaffold uh, what I am claiming with some citations, but to provide information for people who want to dive deeper. So don't just consume, create. Architectures of participation is a phrase that, that Tim O'Reilly used when he talked about the way the web enables self-interested acts 
to add up to public goods. Uh, social bookmarks, making links on pages, anytime you make an intelligent decision and share it, uh, you are uh, not only benefiting yourself, but you are improving the commons. And curation, as I noticed, noted, is a lightweight way of taking advantage of and of contributing to collective intelligence. So I asked around, I asked people, what would your advice be to someone who finds a community online and wants to participate uh, in that community? What's the first thing they should do? And the first thing they should do, I learned, and it's consonant with my own experience, is to learn the norms and boundaries of the local cultures before participating. Doesn't mean that you have to spend years studying it, but look around and read the FAQ. Uh, and if you know somebody, do some back channel communication with them. It will multiply your uh, chances of success in that community. And please, Crap detect thyself before broadcasting questionable information. Being a good participant, a good online citizen, means not passing along bad information. And the only way you can do that is to test it, at least some of the time, before passing it along. So I sometimes think about what are the unique affordances of new media that enable them to grow rapidly. And I think it's, it's clear that the personal computer is the universal machine. The unique affordance of the personal computer is that you can write game software and it's a gaming machine. You can write word processing software and it's a writing machine. When you plug those computers into a compu communication network, the many-to-many -many capacity, the ability of people to find each other around shared interests, and to engage in collective action of all sorts together is the unique affordance of this medium. And there are many flavors of collaboration. I just want to touch on a few of them. In the book, I get into more detail about how you could go about it. Smart Mobs, of course, was the subject of the book I wrote 10 years ago. And I, I did a NMC presentation on that. Gee, I don't know how many years ago, maybe seven or eight years ago. Uh, what we are seeing with the Arab Spring, what we're seeing with Occupy Wall Street, is actually nothing new. I started uh, tracking this in 2001. And I concluded that the merger of the mobile phone, the internet, and the personal computer was lowering the barriers for collective action of all kinds, uh, including political collective action. What you're seeing here are, is what was called the Penguin uh, Revolution in Chile, in which students outraged by the lack of funding for public education in their country chained the doors shut to their schools, walked out and induced 700,000 other Chileans to join them in the streets. And they started a dialogue about education in their country that continues to this day. Virtual communities, this is the, the term that I put into the vocabulary in a, a 1987 article in Whole Earth Review. And of course, today, whether you are a gamer or a cancer patient, you are probably communicating on a regular basis with people that you consider to be close friends who you may have never met uh, in person. Smart Mobs, what book was that from? That was from the book Smart Mobs. Um, swarm computing or distributed computation, it really started with uh, SETI at home, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So a big radio telescope in Puerto Rico that sucks down signals from outer space. American taxpayers do not pay to find out whether there are messages from uh, other civilizations there, but millions of People around the world have downloaded a screensaver, and when their computers go to sleep, the screensaver wakes up, it downloads some of that data from outer space, it runs a pattern recognition algorithm on it, and it sends the, the data back to SETI headquarters. What's interesting about that is that uh, 2 million volunteers amassed 30 teraflops, 30 trillion operations per second of computing power. And since then, we've learned that you can use it for all sorts of things. If you go to folding, 
www.stanford.edu, or you go to the online game, fold it, you can help biochemists understand how the immune system works, how to create new medi medications uh, by understanding how proteins fold, a task that is uh, computationally intractable for individuals but begins to become uh, possible when millions of people contribute computing power to it. So, you know, 10 years from now, we, we already have 5 billion mobile phones in the world. 10 years from now, we're going to have billions of people walking around with supercomputers linked at broadband speeds. What kind of scientific research, what kind of computational research are populations going to be able to do together that, that we're not able to do even with the most powerful mainframes today? And crowdsourcing is, is most often talked about in a business sense of cutting up a task into many uh, small subtasks and enabling large numbers of people to tackle them. It can also be used for uh, humanitarian purposes. The, Jim Gray was a computer scientist who went missing. He took his sailboat out on San Francisco Bay a couple of years ago and he did not come home that night. His friends uh, in the computer science world obtained recent photographs of that area from NASA and from Google. Uh, Microsoft engineers cut it into half a million images and thousands of volunteers on Amazon's Mechanical Turk program searched through 3,500 square miles of the Pacific. They didn't find Jim Gray, but they put this together from parts that were existing um, then, and I think we're going to, to see all sorts of ways of crowdsourcing. Certainly, we're, we're beginning to see uh, crowd mapping for disasters, crowd mapping in places like uh, Haiti and applications like Ushahidi.com taking advantage of this for uh, humanitarian purposes. Forms of collective intelligence, Wikipedia being the, the most well-known, but certainly not the only one in which um, many people contribute small uh, bits of knowledge that add up to a lot. Who would have guessed just a few years ago that a few thousand volunteers would put together a an encyclopedia in two, 200 uh, different languages with millions of articles. And cooperative learning. You know, you no longer have to sit in a classroom and listen to a teacher if you want to learn something. When you want to learn how to do something these days, many people go to YouTube. And we are seeing all sorts of pa platforms emerging, the, the school of everything, P2PU, there are dozens if not hundreds of them that enable uh, self-organized self-learning. And I think that this is a, a going to increasingly be an important part of cooperation. And one of the projects I'm working on now is the Pedagogy Project. If you search on Pedagogy, you'll find a description of what we're doing. Um, what does a group of people need to know if they want to learn a subject using the resources that are available online? How do they find and qualify resources? How do they arrange those resources with uh, learning activities? How do they assess? How do they make decisions? Um, I think, uh, so we're trying to create a pedagogy handbook. I think we're going to see more and more cooperative learning. So again, just a few highlights of this uh, literacy of uh, cooperation and collaboration. You know, we've, uh, I talked about this in my, my TED talk uh, seven years ago. Uh, we live in a world uh, that, that sees uh, human behavior through the lens of the 19th century. There's an old story about how humans get things done, which is uh, that uh, biology and society and business are based on fierce competition and that only the strongest survive. But recent discoveries in a lot of different fields are indicating that uh, the role of competition, while still central, needs to shrink quite a bit to make room for new understandings about cooperative arrangements and collect uh, 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 complex interdependencies um, from the level of the cell to the level of the ecosystem, 
from uh, on the political level, on the social level, um, organisms and people cooperate as much as they compete. And the tools that we're using and the literacies about using those tools enable us to do things together politically, culturally, economically, socially, in ways that we were not able to do before. Actions and collaborations climb that curve of engagement. Uh, getting involved in a small way usually leads to getting involved in a larger way. There are a wide variety of ways to participate in collaborative activities. One of the, the strengths of online collaboration is uh, what open source programmers call self-election. Instead of having a hierarchical uh, managerial status uh, that, that tells people what to do, people decide, I'm the expert on this, and I'm going to contribute my expertise uh, to that. So find a way to participate that makes sense to you. And enable uh, self-election. Your, your collaboration is going to be more successful to the degree that you enable people to choose the tasks that they participate in. This obviously isn't going to work on everything. I don't think you're going to be, be able to build a 747 that way. But we haven't really reached the limits of what social production um, can produce. People contribute for a lot of reasons. Uh, in Stephen Weber's book, The Success of Open Source, he cited a research uh, that surveyed people who contributed to open source programming. And it turns out that the number one reason that people contribute to open source is to learn to be a better programmer. So people contribute to collaborative work for a wide variety of reasons, to enhance their reputation, which they can indeed convert into money at some point, to learn is a very important one, to, socially, to meet other people, and altruistically to add to a public good. And the evidence seems to indicate that a, a group with a mixture of motives is more effective than one that, that simply has a, a financial or an altruistic incentive. Casual conversation builds trust. I noted that social capital, the capacity to get things done with others informally, uh, rests on networks of trust. It's why when strangers meet, they talk about the weather, they talk about sports, they're trying to find a neutral topic so they can kind of get to know each other. So a lot of the idle chatter you see in comments on blog posts or in Twitter uh, can serve the purpose of getting to know people so that you can trust them to share more important information. So finally, I want to talk about network awareness. Network awareness is a literacy that consists of a large number of uh, small pieces of knowledge that come from different disciplines. So uh, very recently, uh, we've seen the emergence of network science that has shown us that the shape and structure of networks, like small world networks, uh, like the power law, um, and like the long tail, can affect the behavior of the, the people within those networks. We're also learning that some of the things that sociologists have been talking about for years before the internet existed um, can be very useful in understanding what the impacts and the pitfalls of life online today uh, might be. And when it turns to uh, notions such as social capital that sociologists studied long before the internet, the person who understands the difference between bridging capital and bonding capital and the importance of reciprocity is going to be more successful. And the people they deal with are going to be more successful than those who don't know that. And now. Um, we're seeing that decades of work on human social networks, which certainly preceded the internet, are helping us understand the ways in which social networks are amplified and distorted uh, when they are transmitted through technological networks. And we're seeing that uh, terms that um, social scientists uh, use now become very important for individuals online. The difference between strong ties and weak ties, the importance of having both 
uh, the emergence of the term social media, the emergence of the phenomenon of viral media, and the overarching idea of a network society and network publics are indicating that we're moving into a world that is not just an information society, it's a network society. And understanding how networks work is an important literacy that, again, helps individuals succeed, but I think also uh, can improve the health of the commons. The connection between these is important. Uh, again, this is all not rocket science. It's collecting uh, little learnings from a number of different fields that have not been put together before. And I think I would love to see high school and college students learn these literacies. And in fact, I've, I have created a syllabus for college uh, instructors and one for high school instructors to modify uh, for their own use and use in any way that they'd like. And I, I can go find the URL for that and post that for you in a minute. So network smarts, network know-how. Networks have structures that influence the way individuals and groups behave and understanding those structures, understanding the, the power law and the long tail and, and small world networks uh, can help you succeed. A portfolio of both strong and weak ties is useful to individuals in a network society. There's a, a famous paper on the strength of weak, uh, weak ties a number of years ago, but more recent research by Barry Wellman at the University of Toronto and the Pew Internet and American Life Project have indicated that the way we extend our portfolio of weak ties online can be very useful to us. Position in social networks matter. So social network analysts talk about centrality. It's not just the number of people you connect to. It's the number of people and the number of different networks who need to move through you to connect with each other. Diverse networks are collectively smarter. This has been empirically proven. A group of experts on a particular topic are likely to come to less intelligent decisions than a group that includes people who have no expertise on that topic. The, uh, and also, uh, some of the collective intelligence research that's been done by Tom Malone at MIT Sloan School indicates that the presence of women will uh, increase the collective IQ of a network. People who can bridge different networks, who can connect uh, different networks, fill what are called structural holes. And those people stand to benefit from that position, from connecting people. Pay it forward. Uh, again, research uh, by Barry Wellman and others has indicated that the strongest predictor of whether you will receive favors from others online is whether you've done favors for other. Again, going back to when I was talking about curation, you're sent, when you help someone online, you do it visibly, you're sending out a signal that you are a cooperator, you're someone that, who's probably worth cooperating with. So the proliferation of new media and new literacies um, really hasn't stopped. It's go going into hyperdrive. If you want to understand how to succeed, if you want to understand how to improve the state of the commons, I think we have to keep up not only with the technologies, uh, but with the literacies. The book goes on sale tomorrow, and you can find out more about it at this website. And so, questions? Thank you, Howard. Thank you so much. Um, we've really been enjoying it. Um, uh, we've queued up some questions from uh, from the chat as you were going along. Um, Ma'am K actually wonders if um, if the content and the things you're talking about in NetSmart are uh, American centric, or do you think they would uh, be applicable applicable um, globally and consistently? What's your what are you, what's your thinking? Well, of course, there are a lot of no notions such as um, uh, privacy and connection to a group and individualism that aren't that that differ culturally. Uh, the Japanese notion of privacy is different from a, an American notion of privacy. The laws about privacy in Europe are different from the laws in America. The uh, cult of the individual is at its peak in America, and the view of the individual and the group is different in different parts of the world. So I think, yes, there are cultural differences, but I think um, 
crop detection is universal. Um, I don't think that you can point to a particular uh, culture that is always honest. I think uh, that's that's always going to be with us. I think the the nature of the medium is participatory and collaborative, and it may be that that different cultures are are better at collaborating and better at getting collaborations going than than others. So I think that there are cultural elements, but I don't think that I think that there's a certain universality to these literacies when you're talking about life online. Great. Um... Lindy from Seattle wonders how to sort out the people who are good collectors as opposed to those who are good thinkers. Well, so the notion of personal learning network, I think, is is good here. Uh, and personal learning network is something that I learned from from uh, other educators. When I first started teaching, I started looking for educators who had blogs, uh, educators on Twitter, who seemed to know what they were talking about in regard to the use of social media in their they're teaching, and um, you need to pay attention to these people for a while and use your own judgment, and pretty soon you can, you can tell the ones uh, who know what they're talking about. And once you find one or two people um, who you consider to be experts, then you can triangulate because they've got a blog, they've got a blog role. If they're on Twitter, you can find out who they follow. Uh, one way of finding expertise that's not guaranteed but is, I think, a, a good heuristic is I look through Delicious and, and Digo. I look for the, the most uh, tagged uh, sites uh, for a um, particular tag that interests me. I look at the people who've tagged them. I look at the early people who tag those sites. I look at what else they tag. So again, it goes back to thinking like a detective. I think you need to engage with with people's thinking. And of course, they make their, their thinking available if you pay attention to their blog or their Twitter and make your own judgments about it. So Howard, obviously I, I saw your presentation last week at South by Southwest Interactive. Um, one of the things I also saw, and I, I believe it was in Tim O'Reilly's presentation, is that he believes that the internet can be broken down into 1, 9, and 90, where 1% of the activity is original content, 9% is curation, and 90% is consumption. Um, based on what you've just said, do you think that that ratio of curation curation is accurate? Do you think it should go up? Do you think the 9% should probably grow? I think it should go up. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, was to, to try, try to improve the ratio of good information to bad information, of participation to non-participation, of collaboration to non-collaboration. I, 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 I'm also seeing in the in the text chat here, um, Lindy Orwin saying the skillful skimming of other people's ideas into a blog post that has a single link into the original source, if any, gives people an illusion of knowledge that is actually just good collection of other good thinkers. Guess what? That's what universities call scholarship. Um, as long as you can put, uh, we build on uh, each other's discoveries. And just collecting material, I don't think, has the value of collecting material and building it into a new uh, insight. But I don't think that we can expect any scholar or thinker or, or scientist to operate with, without standing on the shoulders of everyone else who's, who's done uh, some work. And, and I think that's one of the great values of the internet, is the ability to work with what other people have discovered. And em Emily asks if you have a specific take on the phenomenon of Coney 2012 that's happened over the last few months uh, in, in reference to what we've talked about today. No, I don't think it's even last few months. It's been a couple of weeks now, hasn't it? Um, right. Yeah. You know, I'm happy to pontificate about things in which I consider myself to have some expertise, and I don't think I have any expertise on this. Um, I've read Ethan Zuckerman's uh, analysis, um, which I would recommend. Um, uh, he's Ethan Z on, on Twitter. Um, and his analysis is, it's a lot more complicated than the, than the video uh, will let you think. And, and I know that that video has been criticized for being oversimplistic and being kind of paternalistic. Um, I would say that it has raised an enormous amount of conversation about what's going on in Uganda. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Time will tell. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think you're right. It, it, we're kind of in, in the process of triangulation right now. Um, Doug has a couple questions. Um, one is, how does the participatory, uh, per, uh, particularly culture play into the idea of um, an opticon in terms of policing behavior online? And uh, you can read his question in, in, in the notes if I butchered it too much. Um, well, you know, the, uh, the final chapter of my book on virtual community in 1992 was entitled Disinformocracy. And the, the, the final chapter of Smart Mobs was always on Panoptica. So this is a fear that has existed for a long time. Uh, uh, people like me have been warning that the development of technology is increasingly threatening our privacy. And I'll have to tell you, I wrote a syndicated column f um, in the United States for the San Francisco Examiner. It was syndicated across the United States in the 1990s. People didn't care. Uh, people have accepted invasions of our privacy for convenience and for the illusion of security. And you know, one of the columns I wrote uh, 10 or 15 years ago was there are, are cameras, our uh, video cameras are going up in public places. Those video cameras are not yet networked, and the software for picking your face out of millions of others is not yet developed, but they will be. And we're there now. Um, and I don't really know what to do about it. We should have had a conversation about this 15 years ago. Um, and Howard, I think we have time for one more question. We've got so many going on. Uh, I encourage people to contact you directly because um, I know that you're available. Um, but Steve at the University of Memphis says, in regard to your vision of virtual communities and tools from many years ago, how does this setting today, this Adobe Connect meeting, uh, exceed or miss your original vision? You know, I, I wouldn't have dreamed that this was possible. I, if you, If you recall, uh, 1987, when I wrote the Virtual Communities article, a modem was 2,400 bits per second. You could literally go put a, a pot of coffee on and brew it while you were waiting to log in and for, the, for words to start coming across your, your screen. I remember when modems got fast enough so that you couldn't read it. Uh, it was too fast for you to read as it came across the screen. And of course, it was just words on the screen. It was uh, light green words on dark green screens, and then the Mac came along and you had uh, uh, black words on white screens. Inline graphics, uh, video, and being able to have streaming video, those are, are, I think, miraculous. It's a little bit like starting out in the age of the horse and buggy and having your own 747. So we, we did dream about uh, the capabilities that would come in future years, but the way we're using it right now, I, uh, it, it still amazes me. I still consider it miraculous. Well, Howard, I just want to thank you again from everyone at, N at the NMC. Thank you for uh, giving away five books. The Twitter um, conversations in the back channel have been fantastic. Um, uh, Howard, we look forward to working with you again and seeing you online and seeing you in person. I, I want to thank everyone that showed up today. Um, uh, please continue to monitor nmc.org for more sessions. So these are what we're calling the uh, Horizon Project Connect sessions. They're, they're, they're loosely structured around the technologies, trends, um, and challenges that we list and report in our Horizon um, reports every year. So if this continues to be of interest, please um, follow us on Twitter. Uh, go to nmc.org, and Howard obviously uh, can be found in many, many places, uh, several videos. So uh, once again, Howard, thank you so much. I apologize for the tech glitch at the beginning, but that's why we love live uh, seminars. Um, I will add that I'm going to be at Elliott Bay Bookstore on, on Monday the 26th at 7 p.m. in Seattle, for those of you in Seattle. So goodbye, and thank you for your attention.